Hi folks, I trust you're well. We're burling through the week. Here we are on Tuesday already. And uh, I hope you're also enjoying Holy Week itself and some of the services and opportunities, opportunities we have, even though we might be uh, confined for home at this point. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Ross Blackman, Minister at Hamilton Old Parish Church of Scotland. And of course, we're doing this webcast just hopefully by way of being able to encourage one another a little bit, you to encourage me and hopefully me to encourage you as we examine a bit of scripture, talk about it, have a wee prayer, and basically enjoy our devotions uh, together each day as we look at our Bible reading challenge, which at the minute takes us through uh, the Gospel of Luke. We've looked at some other um, books and letters already, but we're now looking at the Gospel of Luke. So um, I want to get straight into it, because it was a passage that we started looking at yesterday, and I'd like to pick it up again today, looking at, Ma at uh, Luke chapter 21, we read the first half of it, which was particularly talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple in particular. Um, Jesus had been asked about the temple itself, and he'd said, well, not even a stone will be left upon a stone. And of course, we know even to this day that that is actually true. Less than 40 years later, um, the temple was destroyed by the Roman armies at that time. But we're going to have a look at the next part of this chapter. We'll finish off this chapter uh, this morning and see what we can make of that. I'm uh, going to have a little bit of a, an overlap with what we've looked at um, yesterday because I want to um, really tie the two sides of it together. I mentioned at the end of, of yesterday that the Roman armies have been surrounding uh, Jerusalem. Some comments I also made two weeks back when we looked at the parallel account in Matthew 24. Um, but let's just see what Jesus has to say on this particular occasion. If you're following this with a red letter Bible, then you'll find that the text will be in red. Um, I've hopefully brought that up on the screen for you, and having looked at that, I'm going to need to scroll down just a little bit when we get to the bottom of that chapter, but we'll do that when the time comes. Well, let's read this together in Luke chapter 21, and we're picking up the reading from verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter it. These are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and all the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves, and you know that the summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. For watch yourselves, lest your hearts become weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you with suddenness like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place, and to stand before the Son of Man. Every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the mountain called Olivet. And early in the morning all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading of his own holy and inspired word unto him in your praise. Well, what are we to make of this passage of scripture? Again, I've covered a lot of the bases here when we looked at Matthew chapter 24 where a lot of people think about uh, the end of days, the end of time, the end of the world, 
as we know it, um, a word that covers out something called eschatology. I've used that a couple of times before, the end times, what's it about? In the first instance, Jesus is quite clearly in this whole chapter talking about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Four years before, the Roman armies encamped around the city, but at the last minute they had to get called back towards Rome, probably because of another uh, dispute and, and um, battle that was taking place, which meant that the realm needed them. And so they, they left. And as they left, the, the Jews at that time, particularly those who'd been um, resisting the Roman rule for so long, had uh, almost a, a guerrilla uh, attack uh, on them, so that all the way back to their boats, to along the roads, wherever they were making their way back up to Caesarea and beyond, they were being harried and attacked, and they lost quite a number of uh, Roman soldiers on that route back from Jerusalem, having had besieged it for that period of time in 66 AD. But by 70 AD, obviously everything else was at peace in the rest of the Roman Empire, and they hadn't forgotten. They came back, they encircled it again, and this time they destroyed Jerusalem, leveled the temple, and took, a, took captive a huge number of people. Um, I, as I recall it, um, a good third at least died in that conflict, particularly in that siege. And another, siege, another third were taken away in, uh, in slavery. And if I'm remembering the details right, but I need to double check this. About another third, I think, who died, uh, were actually put to death uh, after that. So between the, the famine took place as well besieged, the time they had uh, after it, when so many of them were killed, and then the others that were taken away in uh, slavery, you know, they, they all were taken away one way or another. It was a terrible time. But Jesus had warned them that when the city was encircled by armies, they should escape. They had an opportunity, they had a four-year opportunity to escape. If they were distracted with the cares of life and they, they missed it, they missed what he was saying, they would have been caught and they would have been amongst those who either lost their lives through privation, through sword, uh, and possibly crucifixion as well, or were enslaved at that time. But Jesus gave them the warning, they had that warning, would they actually be listening up for it? Because bear in mind these events took place over 30 years after Jesus had been crucified and resurrected. Perhaps they thought time had passed and these things just weren't going to take place. I have to say that whenever the, uh, the other apostles talk about Christ's return, the, there's a sense of immediacy about it. When, when Paul talks about it, for example, he anticipates that Jesus is going to return at any moment. The other disciples, whenever they write about these kind of things, and in all the gospel writings, the way it's phrased, the way they recount what they remember of what Jesus had told them, they expect an imminent return of Jesus. Now, in the first instance, of course, we, we think, particularly coming up to Easter, of his resurrection, and those first 10 days uh, of, I'm sorry, first 40 days uh, afterwards when um, he was appearing to them. Um, time and time again, they was in their midst. He had returns to them in that first sense. In the second sense, of him re returning to earth and doing something about the injustice in earth, uh, in, in the planets, particularly amongst the Roman Empire at that time, they seemed to have this sense of it was going to be an immediate thing, it would happen any time. But of course, that didn't happen in a physical sense of Christ coming on the clouds and, and uh, revealing justice to the nations at that time, in the lifetime of any of the disciples. None of them. The tradition has it that each and every one of them, probably excepting John, uh, was uh, put to a martyr's death. And so they didn't get to experience that themselves. What are the ways that we can possibly understand this though? I mentioned when we looked at uh, Matthew that um, because so much of this is uh, revealed actually in that first century uh, as an answer to what Jesus had said, maybe there's a, a meaning in this for ourselves in that Christ comes for us, um, he reveals himself to us, we have an opportunity to follow him, to have faith in him, he reveals himself to us in all sorts of different ways, and particularly in, in his presence with us as we walk following Christ, the way he strengthens us in everything that, 
that takes place. There are all sorts of different interpretations as to how that can happen, uh, quite charismatic interpretations as to how that can happen, evangelical interpretations, um, but whatever it is, that belief that's held in common in Christianity, that Jesus is with us uh, and experiencing life with us even yet, not just the time that he spends on earth, but the time he continues to accompany us uh, in what we experience, um, is, is something that's a very real thing to us. So that's the second way. And uh, I, I think that's also a, a very good way of, of looking at this. And then last but not least, is Christ actually going to physically return and do something about the injustice in the world? That seems to be the language that Jesus is using. But he's at pains to state that we won't know when that is. It could happen at any time, in any generation. And there have been literally hundreds of generations since uh, that time actually took place. So we, we want to maybe think carefully about that. We don't want to in encourage, and I certainly wouldn't like to advocate and encourage us being um, overly anxious about it and, and being in, in such a tiz that we anticipate Christ coming at any point possibly um, that, that we're, we're afraid of world events, particularly current world events, for example. That you know, these kind of things would, would throw us into a, a real turmoil as to what's going to happen next. Especially the language Jesus uses of, well, you know, for the pregnant women and for, for those who are nursing, you know, woe to you, because it's going to be very difficult. You know, this, kind of, this kind of language um, is very difficult, and it was experienced by people in the first century when Jerusalem fell. How are we to anticipate that in our own time? I want to just take the flip side of that and just say that a healthy level of anticipation is no bad thing. And I wouldn't want us to go to extremes in that. A lot of cults, for example, play on that idea that you know, it's the end of the world is nigh, it's going to happen in our lifetime, and we try to put dates on it sometimes. I'm not going down that route at all, but I do think a healthy idea that Christ is looking after us, he's walking with us, he's watching us with what we do in life, so whether he returns for us when we move from this life into our eternal life with him, or whether he does return to earth and do something about what we see going on in there, on this planet, um, is almost neither here nor there. Because we're already trying to walk with him. We're already anticipating him. We're already trying to live our lives in a manner that, that shows that we have faith and, and to help our fellow human beings wherever it's not, not at all possible. And I just want to pick out one verse in this, which is, um, is it verse 34, it's really towards the end. He just simply says, watch out, lest your hearts become weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that it come upon you suddenly like a trap. There's his warning. There's his warning. That's, you know, we, we have our ups and downs in life and with our faith, there are times perhaps when we're not as watchful as we might be, not just in a spiritual sense, but even in, in how we comport ourselves, how we live our lives. There's a reality to that. Um, but Jesus is warning us here. Don't let that become the norm. Don't put his, his forgiveness and his mercy to the test. And when he does return, it, it is going to be sudden, like a thief in the night, uh, as Matthew put it, didn't it? So there's something to think about there, about how we behave ourselves. Living a good Christian life, yes. But bearing in mind that it's not the good Christian life which saves us, it's Christ himself that saves us. Our faith in him is so fundamental in that. The way we act as it being good Christians is actually only really an evidence of that faith that we already have and that salvation that we, we apprehend. And so with that in mind, we're putting first in our lives. And, and uh, we think and act in the way it's appropriate in any age that we might be living in, in any generation, which has been the case since that very first Easter, and one that we anticipate even this week as we work our way through the Holy Week, following Christ, even as we follow through Holy Week. I hope that's helpful for you. I hope to, as well as maybe following along with us day by day, you're getting a chance to watch the Holy week services that we're uh, putting on each evening online and of course on Friday we're particularly going to have uh, something special there because the Passion Play 
will be going uh, online on Good Friday at uh, 3.15 as well. I do hope you'll tune in for that also. But for now, we'll, we'll leave that just now and uh, anticipate other things. But let's have a wee word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, let us never take for granted what Christ has done for us and take for granted your mercy and kindness to us. We thank you that we are encouraged that Jesus walks with us in all our trials and tribulations, whether they are, are small and momentary and light, maybe they last a matter of weeks, even in the challenges we're currently facing, whether they last a lifetime, or whether they're even as dire as was experienced in the first century in Jerusalem particularly to people who took no note of what Jesus had said to them. Help us to take note and forgive us where we aren't as diligent and as watchful as we ought to be. Help us also to be diligent and watchful when it comes to looking after our neighbours where we possibly can, both in what we don't do but also where we are able to help. We pray again this day for our frontline services, especially our health services, but all the support services and every other way that we're being enabled from the delivery drivers to, to everybody that helps in all sorts of ways to make our life at this time a little bit more bearable in these challenging times. We heard just last night that our Prime Minister has been taken into intensive care and Heavenly Father, we take time to pray for him. Whatever our politics might be, we just set aside whatever our, our views of the man as an individual might be. Nonetheless, our duty is to be praying for those in authority, as we're reminded in Scripture. And so we pray for him, Lord, that your healing hand would be upon him, and that he might be helped and strengthened even in the time that he's experiencing at this time. That you would lend strength to the hands of physicians, and that uh, he might come through this uh, healthily. We pray that not just for him, of course, but for so many who are unwell at this time. That at this time, are perhaps first and foremost in our prayers and also in our actions where that's possible. Help us never to be unfruitful, either in our prayers or in our activity. Help us to live good Christian lives and show the whole world and even ourselves that Christ is someone that's worth following. And it's what he had to teach us is worth listening to, that his way of life was something that was worth emulating, and that as we seek your face, Heavenly Father, that we might love him, even as you loved him, calling him the beloved, the one whom we ought to listen to. So help us this day as we face yet another day with all that it might contain within it. Help us to face it with a level of anticipation and even excitement for what might possibly come of it. We ask these things in the name of Christ, our King and our support. Amen. I trust that's been encouraging for you again today. And uh, please do feel free to feedback in whatever means you're able to do. I'd really appreciate that. But for now, take care. God bless. I hope to catch you again.